the SLO 420 for professional and personal use. Here's a neat VCR. They're all neat. This one's especially neat. This is a Sony SLO 420. This is an industrial Betamax VCR. So the SLO, and I think there was SLP as well, series uh, Betamax from Sony. Those were like the industrial commercial grade ones meant for businesses and stuff. And I believe this is basically just a modified version of the SL2500. Um, anyone who's familiar with the SL2500, it's very, very similar. That I believe was the first slimline Betamax. And so you can see this is very slim for being from 1982. Um, it also had a lot of very cool features for the time. First one with a linear counter, I believe. So this uses the uh, tracking pulses to give you real-time uh, information for your counter. It has all these uh, special effects features. So beyond just beta scan and pause, this has a little swing search control that lets you uh, step frame by frame or uh, do different uh, slow motion speeds or uh, one times one times two in both forward and reverse directions. It did have a wireless remote, though I don't have it. Uh, this one has all direct drive, so each uh, spool for the tape has its own motor, these little flat, thin, they call them pancake motors. So capstan is direct drive, both spools are direct drive, the uh, drum, video head drums, obviously direct drive. And uh, yeah, taking a look at this, uh, the big differences between this and the consumer SL2500, this one had uh, dual channel audio, which is the beta equivalent of like linear stereo on the VHS side. The only uh, consumer model that ever had linear stereo, basically this, uh, was a Marantz branded VCR from the early 80s that didn't do very well because obviously linear stereo sucks for sound quality. But the industrial Betamax models did have two channel audio. And I believe that so you could do things like, well, you record a mono signal onto both tracks, but then you can do an audio dub and you can dub voice over one of them. You can do some sort of rudimentary mixing. Taking a look over here, of course it's a industrial model, so there's no tuner. This lid cannot be opened. Except it can. This is where your tuner controls would have been. Now it's just filled with a circuit board. I mean, it's not that the lid can't be opened, it said it should say this lid should not be opened. Going back to the front here, this does have index feature, which is nice, so you can do index markings on the tape. I think this goes all the way back to like the SL5800 had that. Uh, counter reset, obviously, this is your RF modulator. This does have RF out. It does a pass through, so it has an input and output. And tape return, which I believe just rewinds back to zero and may or may not eject the tape, I can't remember. This does have a timer on it still, just like the consumer versions. You can switch over to clock. Dimmer for the display. Now what's interesting is this input select. Uh, this doesn't have a tuner, but it still has a select going from TV to line. There's a connector on the back that I'll show you. Um, but basically it's one of those old school connectors that went directly to the TV to use the tuner and all the um, stuff in the TV for the VCR. So it was not like SCART, but similar. It's got audio in, audio out, video in, video out. So it interfaces directly with the TV. Anyway, that's what this switch is between. But for me, I just keep it online. This will record in beta 2 and beta 3. Uh, it'll play back in all three beta speeds, which is nice. Beta noise reduction. The uh, RX, which is some 
industrial feature that I'm not really too sure about, so I just leave it off. And like any stereo VCR, you can do uh, audio controls. So you can say channel 1, 2, that's stereo. 1 left just puts that on both speakers, and 2 right puts channel 2, or the right channel on both speakers. You have microphone inputs for both, and a stereo headphone out. So you could play one of your corporate presentation videos on here, and you could dub over one of the channels with a microphone. If you wanted to, right? That's a thing. Another neat feature that this had, which might have been a first for the, the SL2500 anyway, this has a little LED tape remaining uh, display on here. Just a little thing that'll tell you how much tape is remaining. So as with anything of this age, this has problems. Uh, there's not a ton of information out there on it, but there is on similar models like the SL2500, 2700, all the direct drive uh, models. Uh, what I'll do is let's pop the top off and I'll, I'll kind of go through all the issues. All right, we're inside. Um, a little thing I want to say about this, I really do like the serviceability of this. So we have this little circuit board above the uh, tape transport. Now this looks like a it would be common to most Sony uh, models that I've seen. They have everything nicely laid out. So like this is the remote control section. This is for the clock, tape remain counter, motor drive. Does that say PL driver? Uh, anyway, you can just take two screws out here and here, and this board will flip out just like that. And now we have access to all the tape transport. And this brings me to the first problem of this machine. And that's, it was experiencing, I guess you'd call it stiction, where the tape sticks to the head drum. Uh, so you get a bit of pulsing with the tape, it sort of jitters. Apparently that's a known issue with this series of Betamax VCRs, into the later ones too. I guess the material they used for the upper head drum would polish with the aluminum oxide from the tape and it would get to be this very flat, smooth, sticky surface that the tape would stick to. And originally the solution, I guess, was just buy a new upper head drum, but these were like, this was a really prominent issue. And some people, um, I guess it's Sony or so 12 volt vids has explained it found that you could just use household cleaners, to uh, an abrasive cleaner, to polish off the upper head drum and bring it back to a proper texture. So that is exactly what I did. I removed this upper head drum, Let's see if you can get a good view here, marked where it was, just like he said in the video, took this off and I cleaned it twice. I cleaned it once and it seemed to help, so I decided to clean it again didn't really help as much more the second time, but uh, this looks great. It's got the nice, smooth, but uh, textured finish. Looks like you can't even tell where the tape has touched it and where it hasn't. So I feel like this stiction issue I'm experiencing might be beyond this upper head drum. Uh, doing a lot of reading about this, these direct drive machines tend to have more issues with that just because of the the amount of torque that uh, these these two motors can drive onto this. So when you're fast forwarding and rewinding, these things are powerhouses. The other uh, issue that I was experiencing is that the capstan speed would not lock. Very similar to that SL5000 that I recapped and then had to readjust all the servo uh, controls to be able to lock in. Uh, this had the same problem. However, I haven't touched any caps on here. So let me pull, there's four screws on this board here. Flip this board up so we can take a look underneath. All right, screws are out. And this just hinges and sits like that to expose the first layer of complexity. This is a very complex, compact VCR. Being from 1982, they packed a lot of features and capabilities into this little slim machine, and it shows. Anyway, um, 
Finding a service manual on this has been impossible. Uh, I'd really like to find a schematic or something I can go through, but haven't found that yet. I did find a adjustment manual for the SL2500, which kind of pointed me in the direction of these controls. And uh, yeah, I twiddled them. I twiddled the beta 3 and beta 2 uh, playback speed control to lock it in. The issue I'm experiencing is that this drifts. So um, in the alignment procedure, it talks about getting an oscilloscope and probing pin 20 of this IC, which I believe is used for the, uh, the capstan servo circuit and you're supposed to get a square wave pulse on it and you're supposed to adjust to get a 50 percent duty cycle on the square wave pulse my problem is that square wave drifts back and forth and some tapes when you play them and there's music you can hear the speeds wavering in and out so i believe that is contributing to the, why these aren't locking correctly and it'll change from tape to tape i'll put a tape in align this it'll play okay but if I take the tape out, put it back in, put a different tape in, whatever, it's now it's out of alignment again. So this is not the solution. There's another problem. I don't think it's necessarily caps. I mean, it could be caps. I don't think it is. Um, I think it's a mechanical issue over here. There's possibly some drag somewhere. But uh, yeah, that's the second issue. Third issue is the left-hand channel for the audio tends to pop in and out, makes kind of a loud crackling sound. Uh, it seems to be worse when the, these problems show up. So when, when the, the tape speed wavers, when this goes out of lock, the audio tends to cut out. So it all seems to be interrelated. The alignment manual did uh, give me the voltages to go and probe. There's two connectors coming from the power supply, 610, 611. They're just over here. Uh, one's those blue and black wires going there, and one I believe is this one. So there's unregulated and regulated 12 volt over there, and there's a nine and five volt here. They all measured within spec, didn't look dirty at all. Uh, the eight, nine volts a little low, that could be a problem, but Again, without being able to follow or even see what the 9 volt is used for, uh, I don't know. Ooh, and this circuit board, which I've just removed this screw and this screw, also flips up. So we flipped up the first one. There you go. And there's just a little plastic insulator piece in between that you can remove. You can get at even more insanity. This thing is just crazy. And uh, one thing that kind of disappointed me is a lot of the other Sony models I've seen from this era have everything labeled, like I was showing on this board, right? This board is completely unlabeled. Like, I think this board is custom for this model and is not common to the SL2500. And you can tell it looks different. And nothing's labeled. So I don't know what any of this is. One nice thing is that... Um, this has those plastic, or normally, I guess when it was sold new, had these little plastic gears here. And I had an experience with them on that Sanyo model VCR3. It was a little tiny compact Sanyo VCR from, I believe, 84, that used this exact loading mechanism. I believe it was, I think it was this transport as well. Like I think this whole chassis was the same chassis. It was right from Sony. And the gears were broken because they always break. Um, I was, un wasn't able to repair it. I still plan to go back to that VCR at some point to try and get it working. It's a really, really neat machine. Anyway, this one has already been repaired. These are metal. One interesting thing, this front door, this door flap, does not look original. It's got these weird silver pieces here and it's unlabeled. There's no... No markings or anything on it, no writing. And uh, let's see if I can get the focus to work. There's plastic. Is that like peelable plastic on it? And uh, I can show you what it looks like when I put a tape in. Let's plug this in. Just 
just a basic cassette is inside. I feel like I've seen this before on other machines or in photos or something, but this isn't what these looked like new, I don't believe. But the loading mech looks nice. It's working fine. And here's a quick look at the back. You can see here we've got some connectors you don't normally see on the consumer models. This is that uh, connector for industrial remotes. Uh, there was a video that Oddity Archive did. He found a bunch of those remotes and was trying them out on different industrial Betamax VCRs. I'll put a link there and there. Kind of neat. This TV connector is the one I was talking about that connects to the older TVs so you can use the tuner in the TV to record to the VCR. So this is an in and an out. Uh, here's your audio in and out. And this is that RX thing on the front. I guess it uses one of these connectors for something. This would have been your PCM caption switch to turn on and off the dropout compensator. Looks like it's stuck in the on position. So I, I don't know. Don't know what that's about. Your VHF in and out. This is just RF modulator and pass through your channel selector switch for the RF modulator video in and out and this uses B and C connectors because it's an industrial model and a changer connector I guess the was the AG 400 the there's like a cassette changer so you could put multiple cassettes and it would eject and put the next one in an interface with the VCR this both this and the SL 2500 supported that I think even the 2710 did TV vertical lock control and of course a big beefy industrial power cable with the ground not common on the consumer models and there's your model number SLO 420 serial number 10,005 I think that's low either low or high I'm thinking low if anyone knows, let me know. All right, first playback test. Do a pre-recorded tape. Actually works pretty good. It seems to have remembered the the uh, setting for the beta two speed just fine. I'll do a wine scan. So do pause. Um, now what I can do is turn on this swing search feature. Oh, you know what? There we go. That's when. Now I can't do it when I'm in pause. Now I'm in the swing search speech function. And I can go freeze. So now that's the equivalent of pause. And if I go and hit forward, now it's going at 1x. So basically playing without audio. Let's go to times 2. Now you'll see there it's not locking. There's actually a separate servo uh, lock adjustment for times two which I haven't played with. You can also do one-fifth which is a slow motion you can hear it slowly slowly moving along there and you can do one-tenth or I can just do step and what step does is it sits on the freeze mode and then you can go one back or one forward. Very precise control. Now this does have a slow motion tracking adjustment so I think I can probably yeah that moved the bar there if I go this way. A little bit further you can play with it to get a reasonably clean image. So that's kind of nice. 
very featureful. Uh, yeah, here's your tape remaining, so you can see we're at the beginning. And as, as the tape plays, it goes down. So I'll get out a swing search. I think I just hit play. Let's try the Beta 2 tape that was giving me problems. As is tradition with old Beta movies, the label has fallen off. As you can see, there's quite a bit of tension. Wow. Oh. What the heck? What is that? Why is that shaking? That is ridiculous. Okay, so that is probably related to the problem. Um, is it coming from inside there? Need more light. That's crazy. I'm going to take a look over here and see what the hell could be causing this. Okay, all I did to make it stop is I just took a screwdriver and just sort of pulled some tension on this tape. And as you can see here, this is the take-up spool. Oh, there we go. It's pulsing. So, I'm thinking that there is a problem. This has electronic... Uh, back tension. Because this uses two pancake motors for both reels, it has this wacky mechanism that's got like a magnet and a, I don't know, a sensor or something. And this basically measures the tape tension here and then uses the motors to control the back tension. So as the tape is going through here, this will just be taking up the slack and this will be providing back tension. Why that is pulsing like that is bizarre and beyond me. Let's hit play again. Turn the volume down. So it seems like the motor over here is pulsing. And possibly this one too, which is causing this to go all wacky. Because I don't think this is an active device. I think this is purely passive. Let me uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's coming from the, the tape in the... Yeah. So this isn't actually moving, it's the tape coming out of the cassette. So these motors are acting funny. Interesting. So this is uh, an example of a tape that I guess is stickier, probably due to age, materials, whatever, degrading. But you can see how the VCR is reacting. Both these motors are freaking out. Now, I'm thinking that that is happening on the other tapes as well, and that's why I'm seeing these weird issues. Uh, that ET tape seemed to play pretty good, but let's try a Beta 3 tape. Also, it's not happening right now, but I did notice a couple times. Again, only with this tape, after it freaked out and was doing all this stuff, it wouldn't wind the tape back into the cassette before ejecting. So these motors would just give up. All right, let's try an old. These tapes are crappy. Um, on 
every VCR I try them on, on every VCR I try them on, I'm never able to get the tracking 100%, so let's see how she goes. Yeah, no lock. I got to adjust the Beta 3 lock every time I put a tape in. So let's do that. Let's let's adjust. Okay, I think I got everything in the shot here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this probe on pin 20 of this chip, chip and hit play. Oops. So now I'm going to hold that there and adjust. And now it's playing stable. Watch what happens when I unpause again. But you can still see, you know, turn the volume down here. You can still see when I hit play that the duty cycle varies. And in the audio, I don't know if it was coming through on the camera, you can definitely hear the audio still waver slightly. So it seems like all the motors in this are having trouble controlling their speed or having trouble with some sort of the, the part of the feedback loop for the servo. I love these. I love these tapes with the windows. They're just, these are the most gorgeous Betamax tapes. I always keep these. These are beautiful. They look like a Betacam tape. I mean, this, this is harvest gold. This is stainless steel. It becomes his hobby. In one of the stories, Holmes tells us that Julie... So here's another Beta 3 tape. I had it perfectly adjusted for the correct duty cycle. Uh, on that tape, this tape, no lock. At the university, there was a good deal of talk about... So yeah, that was just a little show and tell of this model. Not a lot of info out there. It's kind of unusual in today's day and age. I like it because it's one of those slimline models. I forgot to mention, this has the DA plus one head configuration, which means it has the extra head for special effects. So one of the heads is a dual azimuth. It's got two heads in one, and then one is a normal head, similar to a three head on a VHS. Anyway, I like it for that reason. I like it for all these special features for the direct drive, that's pretty cool. And the two channel linear audio. Very, very, very uncommon on Betamax outside, of course, the industrial models like this. Anyway, if anyone has any experience or recommendations on what I should look at next, please let me know. Yeah, so it's not locking in any- whoa, I gotta blank that. <laughs>